Fallschwermjäger. That was a German name for paratrooper. I don't know why I started the episode saying that. Nobody Tom, knows why you did that. My how are God. how are you doing? Do you know that the German word for paratrooper is Fallschirmjäger? I did not know that. Well, now you do. Thank you. They had a you, you know the, the 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 Nazis had an aquatic little jeep that could go in the water that they called a Schwimmenwagen. That's sweet. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, what do we call it? That's our swimming wagon. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds it like is. a G.I. Joe vehicle. It does. The, the old Molly Schwimmenwagen. Tom. Yeah. How are you feeling? Two, Man, I'm, two I'm, pieces of shit into this. I'm, I'm vibing on some clown shoes right now. You are vibing on some <laughs> clown shoes. Well, t- right now, Tom, this exact moment, mm-hmm. this second in time that we mm-hmm. both inhabit, which yeah. may be eternal, if, if certain philosophers are right, this very moment could go on forever, both forwards and backwards in time, mm-hmm. could be completely encompassing, as all moments are. Mm-hmm. This moment, we're going to talk about a guy you have heard of, Mr. Morton Downey. Jung oh. Yar. Mm, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, dances all the way down. Just, just yeah. hits my ears. Mm. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. A fine oh, that's line. a name. That's a name. <laughs> yeah. Tom. Yeah. What do you know about Morton Downey Jr.? Oh, man. MDJ, he's like, as we call him. He's like a pinky ring that fell into a puddle of toxic waste and became a man. <laughs> he's, he's, he, play, he plays the, sli, he plays the uh, slimy journalist that Danny Glover punches in the face in Predator 2. And he sure is in Predator 2. You're goddamn just right. Playing himself. Yeah. <laughs> he's absolutely he playing himself in Predator 2, in Predator which is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Easily the second best Predator movie. It's it's easily the second Predator film. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, Definitely. You can't take that away from it. Yeah. It is the second one of them. Indisputably the second <laughs> Predator film. Yeah, no, he's like a he's he's uh he was sort of like um the uh the the ying to Phil Donahue's Yang at the time, where Phil Donahue was like kind of nice and personable and Morton Downey mm-hmm. was a real son of a bitch. Yeah, Morton he was a real piece of shit. Yeah. And the fun thing about Morton Downey Jr., Tom. Uh, is that if you start researching Morton Downey Jr., the first like Google result that tries to autofill when you start typing his name in is, is Morton Downey Jr. related to Robert Downey Jr.? And my answer to that is it does not appear to be so. No, it's just it a, no. Just a, just a fun coincidence. <laughs> Which is weird because he does have a famous dad like Robert Downey Jr., yeah. Um, but just a completely different one. I just, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. very funny. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's, 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 let's talk about MDJ. So Morton Downey Jr. was born on December 9th, 1932 in Los Angeles, California. His father Damn. was obviously a guy named Morton Downey. Yeah. Two thirds of these guys are Californians. Well, that in the thirties, I'm like, uh, fuck, he's old. Yeah. Like a lot of these, yeah, these fuckers are ancient, mm-hmm. dusty old racist mummies. Well, that's because they were established by the time the eighties got going and they could really start fucking some shit up for everybody <laughs> that's true i keep forgetting that the 80s was four decades ago yeah it's been a long time since the 80s thank god so um <laughs> his father was obviously morton downey which probably means nothing to everyone listening but it meant an awful lot to people in the 1920s and early 30s morton downey's nickname was the irish nightingale and he was one of the most popular singers of his day he had Morton Downey Jr., whose first name was Sean, with his first wife, Barbara Bennett. And Barbara was famous because she was the sister of two women who were famous actresses. Morton Downey Sr. would ultimately have five children, four sons and a daughter. He was not a nice man, or at least people who knew Morton Downey Jr. say he did not think well of his father. There is, in fact, significant evidence that he despised the man. He desperately wanted to succeed as a singer, and he tried repeatedly as a young man to follow in his father's footsteps, appearing on early game shows where his rep- performance was reviewed positively by guys like Dean Martin. I thought he had an all right voice, but most experts agree he just didn't have what his father had. There was something lacking in his voice that like he was just never going to have the kind of career his dad had. The Downey family were well to do. He grew up, you know, rich ish. Um, they lived in, I mean, if you want to know how well to do they were, they lived in Hyannisport in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and their next door neighbors were the Kennedys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's like, that's how, that's how much money they got as kids. Yeah. Rich ish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're hanging, they're hanging with the Kennedys. Yeah. Morton Downey Jr. was good friends with Joe Kennedy while Morton or Morton Downey Sr. was good friends with Joe Kennedy. One, and um, as when Morton Downey Jr. was a child, he would hang out regularly with the Kennedy boys, you know, like he knew Robert and JFK when they were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, like they were all buds together, I guess. 
Downey, I mean, he's a bit younger, but Downey attended New York University and like the other, and like our other subjects, seems to have immediately known he wanted a career in radio. He got a job as the program director and announcer for a radio station in Hartford, Connecticut in the early 1950s. Over the next decade and change, he was hired primarily as a DJ, although he also sang for several pop and country records and wrote a handful of songs that saw modest success. Like Wally George, Morton Downey Jr. bounced around various markets, Phoenix, Miami, Kansas City, San Diego, and Seattle. Also like Wally, he was a huge asshole and had trouble working with people. He was forced to resign from a Miami network when he gave the home phone number for a competing DJ out on the air and insulted the man's wife. Oh, boy. <laughs> like, mm. dox the guy on, live on the air. Uh, yeah. I want to I wanna hear, hear him croon. I had no idea that was his background. Oh, I mean, we can. He cut an album, Tom. Oh, boy. You know what, Tom? We'll play this right now. Sweet. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's let's mm. do this now. I need you to hear his song about wanna... the war on drugs. What's it called? Hey there, Mr. Dealer. Oh, man. <laughs> hey there, Mr. Dealer. Drug pushing son of Messing up the minds of the kids of America just to make you fat rich. You're the sleaze bag of the country. He's like attacking the microphone. <laughs> yeah. To welcome you to his eternal promise land. He looks like a skeleton at a costume contest dressed as Dean <laughs> yeah. Martin. All right, that's probably enough, that's enough of "Hey there, that's Mr. Enough, Dealer." That's Dear God, it is so. Enough. This will mean more when you <laughs> had. <laughs> Dean Martin was too kind to him. <laughs> he was that better when he was younger say. too. <laughs> yeah, his he's earlier just, st- his earlier shit is I think because he's he's he was he was famous when he recorded. Right, he's this. doing so he his was like doing thing. thing. Yeah, but he's still like yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, I don't think he had a bad voice in the stuff you can hear from Younger. There's a good documentary about him He's called The Vocateur the that plays He's it. But yeah, he is he is going real aggro there. Yeah. Um, and it's because, you know, he was already a name at that yeah. point. I think he was, he was doing a bit, or maybe he just like was out of his mind because that's what being famous does to you after a while. I don't oh, know. Oh, you, you can see the cocaine just like in an aura. Yeah, yeah. It him. followed him around. Mm-hmm. In 1968, Morton took a break from his work, his career, which was, again, he was kind of a mix of a DJ and and a a kind of a pinch hitter in the music industry coming in to do background vocals and stuff, to work on that campaign for his good childhood friend, Bobby Kennedy. When Kennedy was assassinated, Morton wrote a book of poetry with the title, Quiet Thoughts Make the Loudest Noise. The book was a way of processing grief, and you can still find a handful of hardcover copies on Amazon for like $148. So, I, I, I am not buying one of them, but I did transcribe one of the poems he wrote specifically about Robert Kennedy's death um, from the documentary Avocateur, and I'm going to read that to you now. Row upon row of grief-wracked followers, sunken cheeks, replacing their years ago happy faces, sang proudly for their departed friend, their final hope, and wondered why a man must die to be a hero, and whether we honor only those our own selfish hearts destroy. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think sunken cheeks is what he meant to say, but, um, but yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of profound. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Morton He's Downey. certainly like a man who's thinking about yeah, like the thoughtful. nature of, yeah. of, yeah, that was, it was thoughtful. You wouldn't call him a shallow man based on that. Um, He's a man who's trying to process complicated and sorrowful emotions in a in an artistic way. Clearly a person capable of not just feeling grief, but of expressing it artistically. Mm-hmm. Um, he continued to sing occasionally, and he made his living as yet another disc jockey until in 1983, the same year that the uh, Wally George TV show starts, a year before Rush Limbaugh got on talk radio, he gets a job as a talk radio host on WDBO in Orlando, Florida. So, yeah. Uh, and again, they're both kind of writing this wave of right wing populism and the rise of the religious right and Ronald Reagan. Like they're part of a thing. They're not starting it, but they are also influencing the way this thing grows. So J- Wally George and Morton Downey Jr. both rode that right wing wave and helped to shape it. Morton Downey Jr. was even more incendiary and control uncontrolled than Wally. He lost his first talk show gig after he punched a guest, an abortion rights activist named Bill Baird, who he then called a son of a bitch. So, <laughs> how many episodes is, in was that? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, Wally George screams at people and stuff, uh, and I think shoved some folks a few times. <laughs> or Nanny Jr. just cold cocks a motherfucker, <laughs> like, months into his first talk show. And again, a radio talk show. <laughs> I wonder if you can hear like the meat sound on the, yeah. on, the on the microphone. I haven't found this audio, but oh, I bet boy. it's great. Next, according to the New York Times, quote, Mr. Downey was soon hired by KFBK AM Radio, a news talk station in Sacramento, California. There he told a joke in which he used the word Chinaman several times, <laughs> angering Tom. <laughs> yeah, not that surprising, is it, Tom? Um, so, yeah, he tells a joke in which he uses the word Chinaman several times, which pisses off Tom Chin, a Chinese American member of Sacramento City Council, who oh, was man. listening in his car. I wonder yeah. why. I wonder why that bothered him. <laughs> well, I wonder why he got angry at that. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chin called the station. According to the councilman and to Paul R. Aaron, then the station's program director, Mr. Chin was put through to Mr. Downey, who let loose a verbal tirade against him. Mr. Downey was discharged the next day. Mm. So he tells a racist joke on air. It offends the uh, a member of the city council who calls, and then he proceeds to be racist to that guy live on the air and oh, loses cool. his job. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually probably should be what yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, the station had to obviously had to shit can Morton Downey Jr. I like that he was but, like, oh, I'm sorry. I'll just be racist to you directly then. Yeah. Do you do what? Would you like me to just be a piece of shit to your face? <laughs> to your face. I did not mean to do it to your back on the air. Yeah. Absolutely not. Oh, forgive me. Yeah. Um, let me. Let me be an asshole directly to let you. Let me be, be an asshole directly to you. I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> Um, so they had to fire him, but he was also, and you'll, you'll hear different things about how popular he was. Um, by some accounts, he was, he was very successful by some accounts, just modestly successful. I, I, I can't tell you which, um, but it, he did well enough that the station was like, well, this guy's built an audience. They're very dedicated. And so when he leaves, they decide they need to replace him with another right wing firebrand, someone who can st- stir up the same kind of populist rage, but also isn't quite as racist. You know who they picked, Tom? I don't. You want to know who followed him into the job? Mm. You, might, you might have heard of this guy. Little fella. You might know his name. Rush Limbaugh. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's how Rush gets his first big political gig. <laughs> was, was Morton Downey being too racist on the air? Was too, was too racist. And so Rush Limbaugh came in and said, I can be slightly less racist than that. <laughs> I can for be, a while, for can, a little while. Eventually, be, I'll be much more racist than that. Yeah, I could be slightly less racist to people's faces. Yeah. Again, for a while. For a while. <laughs> yeah, for, for a while. Yeah. I love the idea that, like, man, that was too racist. Yeah, was, Let's get Rush in here. Let's get, uh, get that Rush Limbaugh kid in here. Yeah. <laughs> we need to tone things down somewhat. Now, Tom, where do you go when you've just gotten fired from your right wing radio job for being too much of a racist? Uh, Television. No, I mean, but what city do you go to? Mm, Portland? <laughs> I don't know. No, Cleveland. Cleveland. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the Portland you get, of the you East. Get, yeah, you get your ass on down to Cleveland. Hey, our rivers are very rarely on fire. Um, unlike Cleveland. So he gets hired by W.E.R.E.A.M. to improve the poor ratings of its talk show department. He was forced out there when he again hurled racial slurs at an elected leader. This one, a municipal court judge. Who could have seen this coming? (laughs) Who could have guessed? Wally George, the man who punched an abortion rights activist and lost his first radio show, lost his second for screaming racial slurs at a city councilor, would lose his third show for screaming racial slurs at a municipal court judge. Oomst among us. <laughs> Oomst among us. Has, has not on a bad day hurled racial yeah. slurs at a circuit court judge or whoever yeah. it was. <laughs> Those of us who have not gone to jail have done that. Uh. Um, <laughs> yeah. So while his former employer wrestled with a lawsuit as a result of this, Morton Downey Jr. moved to Chicago to do it all over again. Mm. So during the both of these strategy, yeah, the OJ strategy, <laughs> <fly to> Chicago, <laughs> yeah, Chicago <laughs> forgives all sins. <laughs> during his first two dalliances with talk radio, Morton Downey Jr. had a regular segment on his shows called the Executive Intelligence Report, which is him reading from a magazine published by Lyndon LaRouche. We're going to have to do a whole episode on Lyndon LaRouche at some point. Um, but for now, you'll have to be satisfied with this quick description of Lyndon 
courtesy of a New York Times obituary. And again, this is the source of of Morton Downey Jr.'s executive intelligence report. Quote, Lyndon LaRouche, the quixotic, apocalyptic leader of a cult-like political organization who ran for president eight times, once for a prison cell, died on Tuesday. He was 96. Holy Defining what shit. Mr. LaRouche... <laughs> yeah, right? That's a motherfucking sentence. <laughs> that is an entire sentence. <laughs> De- Defining what Mr. LaRouche stood for was no easy task. He began his political <laughs> career on the far left and ended it on the far right. He said he admired Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, Abraham Lincoln, and Ronald Reagan, and loathed Hitler, the composer Richard Wagner, and other anti-Semites, though he himself made anti-Semitic statements. (laughs) And boy, did he. A lot of them. He was a fascist, Tom. He was a a, a fascist political cult leader. I like that the Um, obituary was like, we don't know what the fuck he believed in. Yeah. He believed in Lyndon LaRouche having a bunch of, like, he had a bunch of followers who basically... It was a cult. Like, they lived for this man. And they would go out and proselytize on the street. They would hand out papers at college campuses. LaRouche argued that environmentalists were trying to wipe out the human race, which is a claim that Alex Jones now parrots. He believed Queen Queen Elizabeth was trying to murder him personally. He argued that Jews had founded the KKK. Mm. And he described indigenous Americans as lower beasts. Mm. So... This is the source of Morton Downey Jr.'s intel. I'm finding a couple of consistent threads in his belief structure (laughs) 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 that perhaps his obituary could have latched on to. It may have. I think they may have gotten into that later. That was like the first two paragraphs. I just... (laughs) That I read that sentence. obituary and was like, my God, that is a sentence. Yeah, yeah that, that first sentence almost knocked me out of my chair. Yeah, what a fucking life. <laughs> Ran for president eight times, once from prison. I was like, yeah. what? It was a tax thing, I think. Um, again, we'll do, I'll have to read into him and we'll do a whole episode on Lyndon LaRouche. He's Jeez. quite a character. Yeah. But yeah, the head of Morton Downey Jr.'s Intel program. Now, the fact that Morton Downey Jr. platformed this guy is very fucked up. And it's arguably more fucked up because Morton Downey Jr. did not really like him. As he told the New York Times, I decided I was going to be as friendly towards these people and get as much information out of them as I could because someday I would expose them. Now, that's bullshit. It's true <laughs> that he did eventually get Lyndon LaRouche on his TV show and he told him apart like it was a very aggressive interview with Lyndon but he also continued to spread LaRouche's newsletter and other publications after that point calling the fascist cult leaders intelligence information quote the second or third best in the world based on what Morton Downey Jr. he Morton Downey Jr. doesn't know Ninth build <laughs> cast member of Predator 2. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mother. I mean, he did make the top 10. Tom. <laughs> look, look, in fairness, that's more than either of us have ever done in terms of Predator That's movies. true, but I'm not out here saying this is the second or third most reputable intelligence <laughs> report in the world. No, you're not. No, no. Based on your your experience, which is you and I both did get to look at the Predator costume yes oh wait no yes, i wasn't did. i didn't well I oh, saw you the weren't video. there that day? i wasn't okay. i didn't go to adi but i saw the video it was rad <laughs> it seems like it would um, be <laughs> I, I just knowing that i was that close to something that had touched morton downey jr was um was just powerful tom <laughs> it was really powerful you know what else has touched morton downey jr mm, in a sexual products, manner these products and services probably right? they fucked him they yeah, fucked these him these products hard. and services have been inserted into morton downey jr absolutely mm-hmm. that is again the only promise we make about our sponsors sophie seems fine with us so i'm just going to continue <laughs> yeah that's an ad that's an ad throw mm-hmm. that's an ad throw baby oh we're back <laughs> So by 1987, Rush Limbaugh's show had exploded in popularity. Wally George was the talk of Orange County. This is kind of the height of the Wally George show, too. And despite Morton's mixed success on radio, a station in New York uh, slash New Jersey, I guess it covered both, decided, let's give this guy a TV show. And I think they're looking at Wally George over in OC. They're seeing Rush Limbaugh blow up on the radio, and they're like, this guy could be a could be a hit on TV. And in fairness, they're not wrong. He was. Yeah, he was. Filmed in Secaucus, the Morton Downey Jr. show was cut very much in the shape of Wally George's hot seat. In fact, Wally even had Morton on his show in the late 1980s, and it was immediately hostile. And I'm first going to play this clip. 
of Morton Denny Jr. on the Wally George oh, right. show. Oh, boy. Two, it's really a Freddy versus Jason I moment. I was going to say two rats <laughs> fighting over a dead cat. Yeah. Oh, boy. And I have to say, before, if you're wondering what Morton Downey Jr. looks like, well, so if he gets this clip together. Remember Iron Giant? Mm-hmm. Remember the bad guy from Iron Giant? He looks like the, Christopher the McDonald. The sleazy fed? Yeah, he looks like he looks like Shooter McGavin. Mm-hmm. He looks like Shooter McGavin. Yeah, yeah he yeah, does. Yeah. He Who is like- the same? I was blew me away to learn that Shooter McGavin and the the Fed from uh, 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 the Iron, Iron Giant, Giant are the same guy. Yeah. Incredible thing. It. Uh, he looks like uh, he looks like Shooter McGavin with novelty teeth. <laughs> he does. He does. Uh, he looks like Shooter McGavin if Shooter McGavin did like birthday parties for children. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here it is. <laughs> You, you're coming up with the usual simplistic answers, Wally, that conservatives who don't know what the hell they're talking about stop. And you've got an audience out here. You've got an audience of monkeys out here who do everything that you tell them to do. He's not wrong. I'm warning you. The next time you... Don't warn me, punk. God. Wally George looks incredible. Look at him. Yeah, Look at him. Amazing. What a man. He looks like the entertainment director on a cruise ship, but like a bad cruise ship. <laughs> the cops have come on now, and they're pulling Morton Downey Jr. Jesus off the show Christ. and tackling him. <laughs> Three yeah. sheriff's deputies yeah. tackled by Jr. Wally. The stage. I still Morton get, Downey I still Jr. get total Roger Stone vibes from that guy with like a... Yeah, just he, and man. obviously all of that was set up ahead of time. The plan was always, I suspect, for Morton Downey Jr. to get tackled yeah. by sheriff's deputies right, on the seat of Wally George's right. hot seat. It <laughs> seems so extreme, and he's already so yeah. famous at that point that they wouldn't. Yeah, they would not dare do that to him unless it no. was staged. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, yeah, it's it's very funny. Um, and and honestly, I can't tell you. It may not have been pre-planned as much as both men just naturally knew going in. This is how this is going to end. Mm-hmm. Like I'm I'm Morton Downey Jr. in the Wally George show. Of course, I'm going to get tackled off stage during like a nearly physical fight between the two of us. This is just how this has to happen. I am naturally enough of a right wing shithead firebrand that ja- that's just in my blood. Well, the thing that like really the moment st- we were on a camera together, this was what had to happen (laughs) right (laughs) whoever wins we lose yeah the real Mm freddie jason situation the thing that stuck out to me was when um there's a scene well not a scene i'm fucking talking about this like it's a movie because it's so staged uh there's a part in the clip where wally george stands up after uh uh uh, morton down he says don't don't warn me he stands up like he's gonna fight but he buttons yeah. his he buttons his coat. He buttons his fucking coat. That's a thing you do when you know you're going to be on camera. You do the opposite yeah. when you know you're about to start throwing hands. Is you want to unbutton yep. that coat. So it's like yeah, you want to unbutton. Right, you might even want to take the if you're really going to throw hands, you take, take that shirt off, off and you fold yeah. it on the table <laughs> yeah. where you say, "All right, here's how things are going to go." Yeah. You know. So the fact that he stood up and buttoned his jacket, it's like yeah, all right, yeah. No, you know you're no, not going to get course. into a of, fight. Of course, <laughs> yeah. That, I, it would have been very fun, but I don't think either of the, well, actually, no, Morton Downey jr definitely threw a punch he punched that yeah. guy who came on his radio show to every you know all the all the what a terrible piece of shit he is and all the the funny things we're gonna do to, to make fun of him on this episode morton downey doesn't look like he hasn't been in a fight no no what? morton downey jr <laughs> morton downey jr wouldn't have survived to this age if he hadn't learned a couple of things about fighting because yeah. that's a man who pisses people off yeah yeah. <laughs> Wally George is a man who was very careful to never piss anyone off uh, until he felt like he wouldn't get the shit beaten out of him. Yeah. Like he was an adult in polite society. That was a kid who hid. Yeah. He's um, a, yeah look, that's a dude yeah. you can bully into giving you an extra ride on the teacups yeah, at the carnival. Yeah. <laughs> like. Now, Morton Downey Jr. was different from Wally George. And in fact, well, he started off as way more out of control again. He got fired from his first job for assaulting a guest. <laughs> um he toned it down for his actual TV show. Um, not much, but in a in an intelligent way. He was actually, in a lot of ways, he he was kind of a mix between Wally George and and Joe Pine. Because um, like Wally George, he would be like a lunatic a bunch of the time and like very loud, get into fights on stage and whatnot, a showman. But like Joe Pine, he could actually sit down and have conversations with people, even ones he disagreed with without just screaming at them. And there were actual debates on his show. Um, so he was not the same as Wally. And I think that's why he was, he made more of an impact because Wally George, it was never anything but just like pure id. And there was 
a little bit of of thinking on the Morton Downey Jr. show. Not, I, I'm not saying that to praise it, just to like characterize the, what he was doing. Mm-hmm. It was a bit different than Wally George. He opened his first episode with the words, certain things really burn my buns. <laughs> and that more or less summed up the focus. Morton was <laughs> irritated by a lot of things, feminism, environmentalism, social justice, and he wanted to make his audience angry too. Like Wally, he was happy to platform people with differing beliefs, so long as they would get into arguments with him that made good television. His show was an immediate success, and its wide audience meant that some of his guests became stars in their own right. One of his early interviews was a little-known congressman, you might have heard of, Tom, named Ron Paul. Now, Morton Downey Jr., not a friendly introduction of Ron Paul here. He 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 brings the, the congressman up on stage by saying, we're going to talk to a man who could be snorting cocaine in the Oval Office. Because yeah. again, Ron Paul, the thing that like one of the things that made him prominent early on is he's for the, the decriminalization or legalization of all drugs. And Morton Downey Jr. is, as a Republican in this period of time, an arch drug warrior. Um, so here's here's Ron Paul on the Morton Downey Jr. show. In other words, you believe that the government should stay out of our personal business altogether. Yeah, this well, is correct. To be my, fact, this all right, is, that's good, guys. But, also but happens more? to be my personal business if I want to kill my four-year-old kid, right? No, 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 no. no? Wait a minute. Wait, you're Why? giving you're giving libertarian a distorted uh, explanation. <laughs> no, sir. You people gave it to yourselves in your platform. No, let me explain that. The answer is that we are allowed to do what we want. We even permit people to smoke cigarettes. Happen. That happens to be the most deadly drug in the United States today. Kills 320,000 people. I appreciate it. And maybe we ought to make I it illegal. I wish you'd ban it. I wish you'd ban it. Good. If you would, then sir, you I'd put it out it in your eye the, right now. You can buy it out on the street and pay $5 a package. Mm-hmm. So you see what I... Number one... Ron Paul really comes across as a reasonable man in that interview. He sure does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you see, you see what I'm talking about. He's kind of a mix of Wally George and Joe Pine because he's way more aggressive and rude than Joe Pine. But he's also he's not just shouting over him. Ron Paul gets he, and he'll 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 quiet his audience down and whatnot. Like he's 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 found this middle level between the two men. Um, that's certainly not like I mean he's a bully, he's a dick, but he, he's not what Wally George was. It's not quite that same level of like, it's not as much of a lynch mob, the yeah. audience. Um, yeah. Uh, still a lot of audience participation, but yeah, less still, violently fascist. Yeah, yeah. But still the bad faith arguments still, uh, of like, course, in the same way that Joe Pine was bad faith. Yeah, arguments, exactly. You know, they all have this in common. They, yeah, they, they all, all have, have this, this in common. common. And I, I just think it's interesting how Morton, I think is very consciously mixing Joe Pine with Wally George in order to kind of like Wally went way too far. Joe Pine is not far enough for today's TV. Nobody would listen to Joe Pine today. Yeah. Um, he's too calm. You know, he, he's it's like he wants to maintain he wants the same kind of controversy and, and intense emotions of, of Wally mm-hmm. George. But he wants to maintain firm control of the show. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly that's exactly it. Um, and this is probably why his show and also, you know, the fact that. When he has people on, even people he disagrees with, he does allow them more of a chance to make their point. Ron Paul gets to say a lot in this interview. And this is, I don't want to say this is like the reason he became prominent, but this is a, a decent part of it. This is a significant reason for his, like, why he started to be, become well known. And it's in part because he does get, he looks good up there. He makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people like listening to Ron Paul on the Morton Downey Jr. show would be like, well, this is a, actually a reasonable man. Um, I suspect, especially considering the kind of like angry young men who would watch the Morton Downey Jr. show. I'm sure a lot of them got into Ron Paul watching this um, in a way that like with Wally George, that I'm sure never happened because he never let people say that much. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, it, it's hard to watch the Ron Paul interview and dislike the man um, where Joe Pine was always chivalrous to his female guests, though, even those he disagreed with. Morton felt no need to hold his punches. At one point he had on a vegan, which is, again, that was like the first thing we saw Joe Pine doing is like yeah. talking to a vegan so he can make fun of him, um, which is a big, a, a long reoccurring thing in like right wing politics. Um, and yeah, she made the point, this vegan that, that, that Morton's talking to made the point that vegan diets were healthier to which Wally responded. I eat raw hamburger. I eat raw fish. I smoke four packs of cigarettes a day. I have about four drinks a day. I'm 55 years old and I look as good as you do, which is going to be funny later. Um, (laughs) although you do have to be fair. 
Like he looks a lot younger than Joe Pine does when Joe Pine was like 40. <laughs> yeah, Joe Pine looked it's like amazing. a pyramid, like a pyramid yeah. made man. <laughs> yeah. Like he says he's smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. Joe Pine is smoking four packs of cigarettes an hour. Yeah. Like he's he's, he's burning through show. that on his yeah. commute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, one of his most popular sparring partners was feminist lawyer Gloria Allred, who again gained a lot of her popularity because of the Morton Downey Jr. show. This is a big vector for a a lot of people who are who are still prominent today. Again, not the only reason, but like this is a big show. This is a significant cultural moment, and she has a big role in it. She's a regular guest, um, and she and Downey would like spar a lot constantly. You might have expected her to hate him, like given her politics and his politics. They certainly fought like hyenas on the air. But as the documentary Avocateur makes clear, the two got along. This was a game, and they were both happy to play it in order to make themselves famous. And I'm gonna have Sophie play this clip. This is from the documentary Evocateur, which I really do recommend. But anyone who had breasts was a feminist. There are almost no feminists who have ever burned a bra, so let me get that straight. There's almost no right feminists who ever had anything that they needed to wear a bra for. Between us, there was a certain amount of sexual tension. Likewise on your jock strap, but in any case... How does she know? She has a tape measure on her tongue? <laughs> Like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Whoa. That's just that's just gross all around. Ew, yeah. I feel like I need a shower. But also you you see the difference again when Wally Wally George never had it like it wasn't yelling at people he was like friendly with. Like clearly he wanted that with some of them. Like he was willing to like talk with Blaze and be like, hey, we could have a good thing going. He was able to find people who were media trained, who were talented in their own right, who could go on and have show arguments with him to mm-hmm. keep the crowd braying. But there was nothing. He didn't he didn't again. He didn't believe in shit. But while Wally George, like, couldn't, I guess, I don't think Wally, what Morton Jenny Jr. was willing to do was have someone get in hits on him verbally. Like, he wanted that kind of sparring, you mm-hmm. know, because that's good TV. I think Wally George was just too brittle a man to accept that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Morton Downey Jr. I don't. I think never would have taken anything really personally because he, he he's a showman and he gets that like. Well, I'm having Gloria on. Like neither of us believe in anything. We just are using this as a, a, a vehicle for our own personal fame. Yeah, and we can say like have whatever fights we want to have. And yeah, they would have made a good couple because they're both <laughs> the same person, <laughs> um, more or less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so eight months into its run, the Morton Downey Jr. show was a wildfire hit. The New York Times sent in a reporter to watch the show as it was taped, and his recollection does a good job of setting up the mood. Quote, Sean Morton Downey Jr., Sean to his friends, Mort, Mort, Mort to the adoring t-shirted fans crowding the New Jersey television studio audience, smoked and paste and spewed venom. You're not licking the boots of the, the boots of the bureaucracy that doesn't give a damn about the American people, he commanded. Bureaucratic bitch, he shouted as the congregation, an unru- as unruly as any splatter film crowd at the nearby Lowe's Metal Plaza 8, jumped up and loudly voiced its approval. So... Yeah, that's the it's it's combative. But as you saw from that Gloria Allred quote, they'll cheer it like somebody getting in a hit on Morton, too. There's it's not it's, the same. Like, we're getting closer unhinged. to Jerry Springer here. Yeah, it's, we're getting closer to Springer here. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. more about the spectacle. They just want to see mm-hmm. they just want to see shit fly. Yeah. Mort was separated from later imitators, people like Jerry Springer and from people like Wally George, who was a little earlier, by his willingness to physically confront his guests. He came very close to getting into fights on several occasions. (laughs) And his studio, yeah, his studio was the first in television to put the audience through a metal detector. (laughs) Oh, man. And I'm sure there was a mix of that's practical because, yeah, somebody might get fucking stabbed. But also that's like. That's another thing we can brag about. That's like, juice. Yeah, this, this just, is TV so hot. We got to have a metal detector for the audience. For the audience. That's how intense yeah. the show is. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a gimmick. As with Wally George, his live audience particularly skewed towards young and disaffected men. A lot of the same kind of guys who would have been in the alt right and would have been like edgy kids online today. The documentary Avocateur includes interviews with some of these audience members, including Joshua Rothman, who is now a history professor, who was part of Wally's regular audience when he was like fucking like, it looks like he's like 16 in this. I'm sure he was a little older, but here's here's Joshua explaining the appeal of showing up to a taping of Mort's show. If you guys and that other the gremlin over there like your pants, this is him as a kid. Hey, shove it where it belongs. Wait, just, well, it was also sort of perfect for 17 year olds because it had no nuance at all. Everything was black or white. And 17 year olds. <laughs> we'll get the power, you guys! 
everything is either totally one thing or totally the other. There is no middle. We are America! We're number one! You know what I think? I think Donald Trump should take his board game and just go to hell. Yeah. That's all that's what you got, man? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Looked like he was going to say something they're, colorful. They're 16 year olds, you know? <laughs> so that that says a lot of it right there. Yeah. Um, both like we didn't have YouTube. If you're a kid and you want to like you feel like you have something to say, you could get on TV. If As long as you're willing to like shout something stupid, Morton Downey Jr. will put your ass on television. Yeah. As long as um, you're willing to get possibly beaten up by him on the air. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, yeah. I know. I get I get it. I get it. It's yeah. He's given them. Not only in uh, he's he's giving them an outlet, um, mm-hmm. yeah, and it seems like they have, like we were talking about with the crowd uh, of Wally's show. Uh, it's it's more that it's it's not necessarily the political views; it's they're latching on to this sort of maximum anger, anything goes yeah. kind of environment. It, it's this space where they can let out. Like for every seventeen year old is angry as shit about a bunch of different things, yeah. and you could get on Morton Downey Jr.'s show, and you could either express real anger with something or what's probably more common you could express the anger inside you and just throw it at anything like it doesn't matter he just wants you to be loud and yelling and he'll be happy with you and and there's no you can be edgy if you want to just say something fucked up on tv he can he'll let you do that it's like shit posting too like all of this like 4chan stuff you can see those impulses he's giving people an outlet for them yeah and they show the clip from their homemade video that they that they made uh, like a sketch yeah, that they did these at home, kids who yeah pretending to be morton downey jr so it's clear that it's it's his like bombastic this character yeah. that he is that they're latching on to yeah. l- less than his views it's more just the way he speaks and the way he behaves and the yeah. way he's sort of you know it's like when people would chant yeah. when people would chant jerry jerry on yeah jerry exactly when people would get into fights it's nothing to do with springer himself yeah and it's it's nothing to do these kids don't care about i'm sure didn't i mean i'm sure at the time they agreed with whatever political shit he was saying but Probably, they didn't I'm think sure, about yeah, politics yeah. they were fucking 17 yeah. year olds like they were just they identified with the the way that he expressed emotion and yeah. the way that he let them do it. And yeah. is there, it identified with an angry white man uh, being an yeah. angry white man on television uh, and being colorful about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Morton absolutely played the role of a religious extremist. Again, I don't think he believed in anything. Certainly not God. But he knew that fights over religion could make good television. And I'm going to play an excerpt here from an episode titled God versus Atheism. And we don't think that children should be they don't want to. Any child is free to pray at any time that he wants in the public schools today. We just and do they say, we're going to give you a minute to pray anytime you want? No, they, the government no, they doesn't don't. tell children when to pray, what to pray, how to pray, or even it if they should pray. It doesn't send breaths like you and Madeline Murray O'Hare got in there and made sure we can't even say in the Pledge of Allegiance the word God anymore in a public school because of you guys. No. Yeah. And it's the same shit you see it's nowadays. A, it's a um, stupid, useless argument we're still making. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. Later on in that same interview, <laughs> Downey tells his atheist guest, this is a nation of freedom. Are you a religion? Then you have no fucking freedom. Just like like nine year old arguments, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what the about? fuck that's supposed to mean. Yeah. Um, now, while the Morton Downey Jr. show had lots of yelling and fighting, some of its most sinister impacts came from the segments that were calm, thoughtful debates. In my research, I came across a roundtable discussion from 1988 about black crime featuring Reverend Al Sharpton, who's another person who really the Morton Downey Jr. show massively increased his his platform, his profile. Like he owes a lot of his fame to the Morton Downey Jr. show. Um, it like it, it made him it helped make him into like a, a regular fixture on TV. Um, while the authority or while the audience does hoot and holler some, the discussion is very civil and it's kind of chilling because one of Morton's guests here goes on an extended tirade about black on white crime statistics, Mm. which is like a major argument point for fucking neo-Nazis today. So here that is. In the United States, in 1986, more murders were committed by blacks, 12 percent of the population then were committed by whites, 85% of the population. These are the numbers right here, right out of the Justice Department figures. <clears throat> and uh, you can check them later if anyone has any doubts on that. When you check the murder figures in interracial crime, now interracial means that you have a perpetrator of one race 
And the victim of another race. When you check those figures, yeah, you find, and I'll just get to the conclusion of it. You find that a black in 1984, a black, Jesus, Jesus, was over 15 times more likely to murder a white than a white was to murder a black. All right, that's enough of this. So obviously, this guy's statistics are very flawed. And one of Morton's other guests, Dr. Gloria Toot, does point this out pretty much immediately. And we're going to play that clip now too. Here's her, like slapping back on this number one your credit is erroneous crime is being reduced in america not simply by blacks but by americans in general we have less crime in 1987 than we had 10 years ago number two the justice department and state and local government officials in crime have admitted that the reporting statistics are an error as it relates to the crime reported by minorities and crimes reported about whites Number three, also it has now been acknowledged by those officials that in many instances, the white criminal is not, is not convicted or even arrested, whereas your minority is. Now I could go on and on and on, but the facts that he has given are just not accurate. And we do ourselves a disservice when we don't look at what the problem is. So obviously, um, That's a more productive debate than was ever had on the Wally George show. It it, it seems more like the kind of stuff you might have heard on Joe Pine. Um, And in fairness, he is bringing on people to contradict and argue with this guy talking about black on white crime. So you could call this on one level a more responsible and productive debate than a lot of what you see on right wing TV today. But I can't help but see in this echoes of the kind of fascist platforming that would become much more common in later years without the measured pushback that Morton's show at least gave it. The specter of black on white crime and high crime rates among black people are two of the most virulent uh, and productive talking points of the fascist right. I could go on a rant about Dylan Roof here, who was he claims inspired to go on his massacre by reading about black on white crime. But this this discussion has very deep roots. And I'm kind of torn between seeing Morton here as someone who handed it better than some people in the right, um, because he did have two very well prepared black guests to counter this line of argument, or whether I'm just more unsettled by the fact that he put this fucking argument on television at all. Like, I don't know kind of where to land on that, but it it leaves me feeling unsettled. Yeah, no, I, I don't trust anything that any of these people do. Uh, yeah. So it's I he just did it for rate. He knew this was a hot button issue for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he had a full panel so that he could uh, maximize the outrage and the, and the controversy. Yeah. And the, just, you know, you, you, you don't get one person on there to talk about their views because that's not going to start a fight. You have to get somebody yeah. else on there to contradict what they're saying or counter what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I think I think what's going on here. But you know who won't platform people spreading Nazi talking points about race related crimes, Tom. Hopefully the fine people uh, (laughs) bringing us these products and services. Yeah, they absolutely do not. Um, Unless it's in which case, whoo boy, here's ads. All right, we're back. Uh, Yeah. So, <laughs> Reverend Al Sharpton was another media figure who got a massive early boost to his career thanks to the Morton Downey Jr. show. I wouldn't, I, maybe not early, but he got a, this really increased a lot of his visibility. He and Morton were regular sparring partners, and they also were clearly friends. Al made for great television. At one point, he called another guest a punk F word in a moment of rage. In fact, it was Al's friendship with Morton Downey Jr. that would prove to be the downfall of the Morton Downey Jr. show. From the Chicago Tribune, quote, it all came to a head when the show began focusing on the case of Tawana Brawley, a 15-year-old African-American girl who claimed to have been raped by six white men, including a police officer, and had KKK and other vile words scrawled on her body. Show after show was devoted to this case, many featuring the Brawley advisor and then relatively unknown Al Sharpton. Downey beat that story to death and his ratings began to plummet, especially after Brawley's accusations were deemed false by a grand jury. So... This does seem to be a case where Brawley was lying. I think it's because she'd like stayed out late and like had to come up with an excuse. And it just was like a kid doing a dumb thing. And then it blew up and became national news. It's the, it's a very sad story. I think she's still like for the rest of her life will owe money to one of the people she accused who sued her. Mm. It's like pretty fucked up tale. And Morton Downey Jr. jumped on it and took it as a crusade, not because he cared about this woman and thought that it was true, um, but because, you know, it was TV. 
and he's Morton Downey Jr. It's a it's hot button shit. issue of the day. Yeah, it's the exact same yeah. mentality behind the debate we just listened to. Yep, yep, exactly. Now, the Tawana Brawley case led to one of the most infamous moments of 1980s television, when Mort had Al Sharpton on with a black white right-wing activist named Roy Innes. The stated goal of the episode was to determine who was the leader of black America. <laughs> Both in <laughs> It's so, oh boy, Tom, um, it's a little more complex than is it Sharpton or Innes, but that that's kind of like uh, the inference that like, yeah, um, both Innes and Sharpton receive a chorus of boos when they're introduced, because that's the kind of show this is. Oh, boy. Mort starts the interview by bringing up comments Sharpton made criticizing Innes. Sharpton goes on a rant calling Innes a sellout. And then this happens. And it's Innes speaking at the start of this. Go ahead. I'm one of the few non-bigoted black leaders run, I would say. Let me state now. Let's deal with the facts. Let's go to the record. Tonight, we want to deal with the records and the facts. Please do it. On this program, your program, you heard me, you have me on tape defending this man. Recently, even after the shenanigans with him and the other That's soldiers. a lot of crap. No, this no, man, brother, you had your crap. chance. That's a lot of crap. Brother, and I got brother, it. brother, and I got brother, it. Brother, I got it. I got it. I got it. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. He just pushed Al Sharpton. Yeah, he the just stage. he just shoved his ass down onto Whoa. the stage, and a bunch of dudes rush up to start shoving. Holy shit balls! Yeah, yeah, he yeah. pushed him right off that the stage. Terrible. He pushed him right off the damn stage. That was some yeah, shit. Yeah, and it went fucking viral. This moment was huge. Every TV show, like every news show, had the clips yeah, of this I on for fucking was. weeks. Oh, shit. Like, wow. in a way that, like, no genocide today goes as viral as this clip of Al Sharpton getting shoved off a stage went, um, wow. which is not a great... It's not great. Didn't love Because I know not why. Great. I bet I know yeah, why. Cause, <laughs> yeah, 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 I bet you, yeah, I bet we all do. Uh, yeah. um, um, bet it's so, racism. Yeah. After the Tawana Brawley case fell apart, nothing could abate the downward slide of Morton's ratings. The next year, in 1989, he made a desperate stab at regaining his relevance. He filed a police report claiming three skinheads had jumped him, beaten him up, and drawn a swastika on his forehead in an airplane ba- in an airport bathroom. Mm. The police almost immediately came forward and said that the facts of the case, as he had reported it to them, did, or as, he's, he, as he had reported it to the media, did not align with like what he had said. Basically, they said, like, he's fucking lying. We have no evidence that any of this is true. Um, we, uh, we can't substantiate any of his claims. And it came out later, one of his friends testified, like, he faked it. He, like, drew a swastika. Like, the photos that he gave the cops are different from like the photos that he put up on TV of like the swastika on his forehead. Like he just like faked getting jumped by skinheads to try to drum up like a media controversy. (laughs) He's just a desperate scumbot bag. He made scumbot, several comebacks. Scumbot, works, scumbot yeah. yeah. He's an and- android uh, created yeah. only yeah. to yeah. be just a scumbag. A, just a, a shit droid full of just yeah. spewing poop. So he made a few different comeback attempts, and he tried to make a living doing talk radio, and he maintained actually a surprisingly robust career in movies. Uh, you've already mentioned he's <laughs> ninth build in Predator 2. He was in Revenge of the Nerds 3, sure. <laughs> which is really quite a film. <laughs> Uh, he was in The Silencer. He was in Tales of the Crypt, uh, to name but a few episodes. Although Wally George really should have been the one in Tales from the Crypt. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 1996, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. No! Which was embarrassing. Yeah, how dare you? Really, we have we we have to thank Comrade Cigarettes for getting two-thirds of these guys That's, out of the yeah. planet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Critical support to chain smoking. <laughs> Um, this was I embarrassing mean, I mean, to Wally. You live by the sword, yeah. Robert. You die by the sword. And he had he made a big deal about being a smoker on the air, kind of like the way kind of Bill Hicks did. If you listen to some of like those routines, yeah. Um, he's he's uh, taking he a drag talk, on a cigarette in like every clip we've we've yeah listened yeah. To, and he yeah. would talk about like these aren't bad for me. I look better than you. You know, we we read that clip a little bit earlier where he's and he about, does look four packs. Like he yeah, definitely he does not, doesn't. He, uh, motherfucker looks yeah, like yeah. He, he doesn't look good in these clips. Yeah, he doesn't like, look good. <laughs> Um, he's all teeth. Yeah. He had, he had, he had made so much hay out of like being a smoker. He had autographed cigarettes. He had promised never to quit, but then he gets lung cancer. And so he immediately becomes an anti-smoking activist, begging people to stop. He told one interviewer, I used a cigarette as a combat weapon and I never gave much thought to the chance that the cigarette would most likely kill me, which is very funny. Mm, Mort. Yeah. 
Morton died in 2001, but his influence lives on. When his show was canceled in 1989, a TV reviewer with the Chicago Tribune wrote that the cancellation, quote, removes from our lives one of the most abrasive people ever to appear on television. But do not think that this represents a move towards a calmer climb. Downey whetted people's appetites for confrontational TV. There will be someone to take his place. Yeah. That's a... It's prescient. There'll be, yep, there'll be yep. a few someones. <laughs> yeah. In an opinion column for CNN, Michael Smirkonish makes this point. Quote, when Fox News launched in 1966, it adopted the talk radio playbook, and NBC briefly gained viewers by giving Keith Olbermann a Downey-like platform for his diatribes against President George W. Bush. The model for each was a toned-down version of that which Downey had established. Entertainment masked as news, constant conflict, good guys versus bad guys, and preordained outcomes. But Downey's influence extended beyond media outlets and should be appreciated as more than just another contributing factor to the decline of America's cultural health. Health. The media paradigm he fathered has taken a toll on the way in which we are governed. There has been a noticeable uptick in incivility and polarization among our leaders in the exact same period in which the media has moved to the extremes, in part because of the power that Downey's successors exert over primary voters. Now, in this column, Smirkonish cites Brian Rosenwald, a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania who did his doctoral dissertation on talk radio. Rosenwald writes... Downey's heirs have fostered polarization through their influence in primary elections. Republican members of Congress must fear infuriating talk radio and cable news hosts because media personalities can use their platforms to offset several major advantages, including significantly greater fundraising and name recognition held by incumbents in primary elections. Hosts demand purity from elected officials, label compromises treason, and glorify Congress, uh, Congress's rhetorical bomb throwers, such as Senator Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, it's pretty, pretty good. There's some quotes in this that are talking about like polarization in Washington that notes that like, uh, as late as the 1970s, the typical member of one party voted with his colleagues, his party members, just over 60% of the time. And that those numbers have raised every decade. In 2010, Democrats voted together 91% of the time, Republicans 89% of the time. Unfortunately, uh, those able to reverse those trends have ceded the debate to the loudest voices. A Gallup survey released in January found that more Republicans regard themselves as independent, 43 uh, as more Americans regard themselves as independent, 43, than Democrat, 30, or Republican, 26%. But any ground gained by the nonpartisan ranks continues to be offset by higher political interest resting at the political extremes. It's all about passion. As documented by Pew Research Center this past, st this past spring, liberals and conservatives exceed moderates and independents in their levels of political interest, which translates into voter participation. So it's it's got most people have been turned off by this this hyper partisanization, but those who stay in the game just get angrier and angrier at each other, and it it just makes for an angrier country. And and Warren Downey Jr. was certainly the most successful person on TV doing it before our modern media era, because Wally George was kind of a marginal figure. He was he was influential in OC and influential to other media figures, but Morton Downey Jr. had a national show, right? Like his he was yeah. everywhere. Um, like I knew who he was, yeah. and I was a little kid. I didn't even really know yeah. why I knew who he yeah, was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, People knew Morton Downey Jr. Um, yeah. He was kind of this perfect synthesis. And that's what it took to really get like this kind of specific kind of right-wing media off the ground, was a synthesis of Joe Pine and Wally George. Morton Downey Jr. was the first guy to do that. And, you know, he eventually, he flew too close to the sun and drew a swastika on his own forehead. <laughs> 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 but you know like the tail of it it's <laughs> just as in the tail of Icarus. it did happen Drew, in an airport Tom said that's true <laughs> yeah. yeah um oh what a dope what a dope <laughs> yeah three people I didn't I don't like very much um well that's if fair. it's any consolation they're all super dead they are very dead two-thirds of them yeah. because they smoked too much <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, man, but uh, it's, a, it's a good thing they didn't do, like, irreparable damage to the country. No, thankfully, we're sailing right along. Yeah, we're good. it's a, a good, good thing, like, yeah. the beginning, like, the seeds they planted haven't grown into terrifying fucking forests of racism. Oh, yeah, no, that never happened. Speaking of which, I'm going to open my news app for the first time since 1991. See what's been happening. Oh, dear. <laughs> Tom, I have some bad news about uh, the Twin Towers. <laughs> No! You may want to sit down for this one. God damn it. Did they smoke too many cigarettes, too? <laughs> In a way, Tom. Fuck. In a way. <laughs> oh, Tom. Uh, that, that brings us nice. to the end of our long journey. 
Ah, uh, thanks, thanks. Oh, hey, thanks for sitting through this with me and a lot of clips. I now know I, I have a fuller picture of Morton Downey Jr. in my mind. I'm glad that was before. that's the only goal I've ever had for this show, which is why this is our final episode. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. Uh, what do you got? A... I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> you're just exhausted I'm just sad now. Yeah. I'm just sad now. I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah. and I'm sad. I uh, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a flaxen Wally George wig. Yeah, I am gonna get a Wally George wig. I need to I need to do something to recharge after this. Maybe I'll watch Hot Rod again or or uh, uh, watch Predator Two. Watch Predator Two. You're right with Gary Busey. Watch, Thank God. Is, yeah. <laughs> By the Danny way, Glover punches Martin Downey right in the face. The best thing about Gary Busey's role in that is that Wally mm-hmm. George could absolutely have played Gary Busey's character in that movie. Gary Busey <laughs> is playing Wally, Wally George, George in, in that film. movie and fucking. Morton Downey Jr.'s in it too. My God, what a film! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get this predator because he's on America. I kind of want to rewatch Revenge of the Nerds three and see what the fuck Morton Downey Jr. was doing in that shit. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't really enjoy watching it the first at time. Least, at least Predator Two has. The I benefit think they of being were on Predator a beach. Two. If I'm remembering <laughs> right, it was on. It was in like the Bahamas or something. I think it's Nerds in Paradise. Nerds in yeah. Paradise. That's I think, right. I think that's one of the yeah. sequels, at least. Jesus Christ, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> that whole movie is a bastard. <laughs> it's it's the Morton Downey of a yeah. film series. Sure you could is. do it. You could do an episode on just the Revenge of the Nerds. Series. Jesus Christ. All right. Well, you got to plug anything, Tom? Oh, sure. Um, I have a podcast network, Gameplay and Employ, that I do with uh, my partner, my podcasting partner, David Bell, also from Cracked. Um, He is from Cracked. Formerly from Cracked. Yeah, we all used to work there. We did, Tom. Um, You can check it out at Gameplay and... uh, Not GameplayUnemployed.com. Patreon.com slash Gameplay Unemployed, where you can check out our Patreon. We got all kinds of cool stuff on there, like exclusive podcasts and other things that we do with our patrons. It's, uh, It's a lot of fun. You should check it out. I also do writing at Collider. And I write for some more news with uh, your friends, Cody and Katie, Robert. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I friends, do... enemies, frenemies. Yeah. yeah. Frenemies. Uh, it, 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 eternal, eternal opponents. Um, and I also write for 1-800-HOT-DOG. Um, it, all kinds of things. You can find me. Just Google mm-hmm. me. Yeah, I'm just out there. Google Tom Ryman. Find him at his home, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Please do. Yeah. yeah. No, dox me yeah. on here. <laughs> Attack him in an airport bathroom and draw a swastika on his forehead to <laughs> improve his career in, for unclear reasons. I really do wonder, like, <laughs> what was the what was the game plan there, Morton? <laughs> like, how is this going to help? Uh, he was gonna he was going to make that in, like, three months of shows, yeah. man. Hunting down the yeah, Nazis yeah. who beat him up. Yeah. He had a whole plan. He, made a, he had a whole pitch deck made. God, I wish we'd all just agreed to like see what he was going to do first before right, we called like him on it. Like, well, I, I do situation. want to kind of see where he's going with this. It's like, like I say, obviously this is all his bullshit, but let's see how long he rides this. Yeah, <laughs> very funny. All right, well that's the episode. 